Hi, everyone. It's Dr. Tofai, your hernia and laparoscopic surgery specialist. Welcome to another episode of Hernia Talk Live Q&A. Many of you are joining me on Facebook Live at Dr. Tofai and some of you on our Zoom channel. Um, thanks to everyone who also follows me on Twitter and Instagram at Hernia Doc. Today, we have an amazing guest, Dr. Sonia Balani. She is in New York, she is a urogynecologist, highly specialized in pelvic pain, um, which is what we will be dedicating our hour to. Um, so you can follow her at pelvic pain doc. I'm hernia doc. She's pelvic pain doc. It kind of works out really well. So please welcome Dr. Balani. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for have for like your time. I'm always so appreciative of everyone who's on the East Coast or like it's later in the evening and. Um, so thanks for your, your time. We won't abuse it, I guarantee. No, oh, it's an honor, honestly, it is. I, I love working with physicians like yourself um, who kind of have the same philosophy of care. So I, I think it's really great. Yeah, we do. So I believe you're my first urogynecologist. We've had gynecologists mm -hmm. and we've had urologists, multiple of each, but we've never had a urogynecologist. So maybe you can start to just explain what makes you like a little bit of both. Um, and, you know, we can move on to all the questions. We have like tons of questions that have been submitted and uh, hopefully in the chat, we'll hear some as well. So it's interesting because my kind of path to doing this is very non-traditional. So, you know, I did my residency in OBGYN actually at New York Presbyterian Cornell, right up on the Upper East Side. And when I did my GYN residency, I worked with this physician named Dr. Ledrick. And he's one of the kind of like pioneers in pelvic pain work. He did a lot of okay. vulvodynia work. Um, and when I would work with him in the clinic, I would say, you know, Dr. Ledger, you're referring a lot to urology. Like, that's kind of interesting. And he was like, oh, yes. Well, there's, you know, a specialist in interstitial, interstitial cystitis because many patients who suffer from vulvodynia have all of these other and started naming other pelvic pain disorders. Yeah. So um, it just so happened that my chief at Cornell at that time was doing her urology, urogyne rotation with you know, Rob Moldwin, who's one of the pioneers in the field of interstitial cystitis. And she brought up my name. She said, you know, I have this resident who's super interested in this field. Would do you want to meet her? And so I was graduating my chief year and I met and I, I met, went and met with him and he said, I think it would be great if you were my fellow. And so I went on Whoa. and did a fellowship with him. And then I stayed on in the department of urology for about eight years until I started my own private practice. How cool. So, so it was really interesting because I'm a GYN by training, but then I did all of these years in urology. So it's like, um, and, and pure, you, you know, like actually the department of Uro urology, not urogynecology. So it's an interesting mix, I guess. That is interesting because, um, so gynecology is what, five years? Four. Four years of residency after medical school. Mm -hmm. And then you did uh, how many years for the, the urology just specialty? One, one year fel fellowship. One year. And were you with other urologists that were like what we call female urology? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay. I was with other exactly female urologists, neurourologists. I mean, there was cancer surgeons there too. It was a department mm -hmm. of actually 24 men. I was one of the only women in the department. Um, of course you were. And then... <laughs> and then um, and my fellowship, I loved it. And they actually said, it was interesting because they actually said, you bring this component of GYN that we don't know about, but there's such an overlap. So stay on and, and be faculty. And so then I often ended up seeing a lot of the patients with things like recurrent UTIs, yeah. incontinence, recurrent BV, pelvic floor dysfunction, interstitial cystitis, um, you know, pudendal neuralgia. And that's really how like kind of this niche came to play for me. Um, but other urogynecologists, there's like a urogynecology fellowship Agreed, within yeah. gynecology, right? Within gynecology. That's more focused on things like incontinence, like mm -hmm. incontinence issues, slings. Um, and so, but my clinical focus was more on pelvic pain and pelvic floor disorders. And, you know, I think it's interesting because there's not an overlap there. Like, you know, you would think that many urogynecologists are trained in the field of pelvic pain, but they're oftentimes yeah. trained in incontinence and things like reconstruction. And sure. so there, you know, it was, so yeah, so it's very yeah. narrow. 
So, so by definition, yes, I do urology and gynecology, but am I tr- that three-year fellowship with the urogyn? No. So, so you're more skilled in like, you can do cystoscopy, whereas most gynecologists don't really do cystoscopy. Okay. Cystoscopy, bladder biopsies, yeah. um, talks to the bladder, you know, that kind of thing. So cool. And just out of curiosity, does that, um, when you get hospital privileges, does that freak them out that you're a board certified gynecologist that wants to do like a bladder biopsy? No, no there's oh, tons, okay. you know, I think that urogynes can actually do bladder biopsies. They just okay. don't do it at the, you know, the amount that, that you end up doing when you work in urology, you yeah. know what I mean? So, I mean, I think at, at the end of the day, it's covered under the same malpractice, so to speak. But I think that the volume, you know, I always tell my patients, I say, you want to go to someone that can do this in their sleep, right? You want like, yes, like you, yes. like you want to go to someone yeah. who does hernia surgery in their sleep. I dream about hernias. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so in the same respect, it's like, if I'm doing doing it all day, every day, then, you know, it just, it gives you a little bit of, um, wiggle room. And, um, but what makes you different is you, you do not see men or do you every so often also see men? So because I was in the department of urology and because there's so few people that are specialized in things like chronic prostatitis, pelvic floor dysfunction in men, I do see men. Oh, how great. Mm-hmm. Testicular pain, um, yes. all that stuff because it falls under the same umbrella and the, the hard part is that men who suffer from this are just as marginalized as women are, you know yeah. what I mean? And there's not enough specialists out there who, who know. So yeah, I, I, when I was in urology, they were like, please do. And, and then I went on in my private practice to continue to see men. Yeah. So much pelvic pain or what's called chronic pelvic pain or CPP is female focused. And I feel that this is one of the few areas where there's much more like avenues and special available for the women and not as much for the men. It's so true. I just saw a patient today actually, and he shared with me his medical records and he went to, um, pelvic floor, I think pelvic floor physical therapist, or Mm -hmm. I don't think it was a physician. And he showed me the, well, as part of the medical records, I saw his questionnaire and it was when you press into your vagina, do you feel a bulge? And I'm thinking, uh, that's yep. not the right question for a male. <laughs> right, right. He must have felt so out of place trying to get help and care from this specialist. And you know, it's so. It's, I love that you said that because it's interesting when I talk to men. I'm set. So, so if we delve a little bit into the concept of chronic prostatitis or CP, CPPS, and pelvic. Yes. Function. Mm-hmm. Essentially the same entity. We call them different names, but yes. you know, in men, it's CP, CPPS. And um, but in men, some of the highlighted symptoms are things like pain at the tip of the penis, pain that can radiate into the testicles. You know what I mean? And so if we don't almost like ask these questions, you're really not assessing for the appropriate things. You yes. know? Um, but I find it often interesting because you're so right in intake forms, it's all focused on. Yeah. Vagina vagina, or yeah. frequency and urgency and, and yeah. not really focused on like specific, you know, anatomical symptoms. Yeah. Um, before we move on this pain, at the tip of penis, a very specific pain, very specific. And there's very few things that cause it. Can you just briefly review, um, when someone specifically has that, that symptom, what it can be or what you think about? Yeah. So, so when someone has that specific symptom, pain at the tip of the penis, it yes. always makes me think about CP, CPPS or pelvic floor dysfunction, which is chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic chronic pelvic syndrome. Pain. Right. Exactly. Now there are different categories of this, right? So there's acute bacterial. I'm talking about, um, category three B, which is non-bacterial chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain syndrome. And this is really important because many men are placed on long-term antibiotics with little to no avail in their symptoms. And they come in to the office and they say, look, I can't sit. Every time I sit, I have pain that that it hurts. Um, I have pain that radiates to the tip of my penis and I have testicular pain and it's all morphed. And I was treated for, for things like, um, for, things like orcalgia, you know, and I was given like long-term antibiotics and nothing is working. And that should be key. You know what I mean? Um, like always thinking about the fact that there is likely pelvic floor involvement. Men also tend to focus, um, also tend to present with things like constipation, urgency, frequently, Mm -hmm. a lot of urological symptoms that's often mistaken for BPH, you know, that's so true. 
I think that that the interest pelvic part, floor spasm, right? That the urgency pelvic. and pain with yeah, exactly because the bladder contracts, the pelvic floor doesn't fully relax. They don't completely empty. They go yeah. to the bathroom, go to the bathroom, go to the bathroom. Yeah. Um, and then we also see, you know, it can affect erections. We, we also see people that will say, I have pain after ejaculation. I mm-hmm. have um, hard flaccid. All of these things can occur um, in men with category 3B non-bacterial CP, CPPS. Yeah, and there's a lot of that that happens with hernias too. So um, oh, inguinal I hernias, it. I know, right? Inguinal hernias can often be a cult, like, or, or you can have a, like an obvious inguinal hernia, but people don't associate inguinal hernias with pelvic floor spasm, mm-hmm. but we've noticed a correlation. So if you have an inguinal hernia, you can have secondary pelvic floor spasm. You fix the hernia, the pelvic floor spasm goes away. So you may not present with a groin pain or groin bulge, but you have the symptoms of pelvic floor spasm. So pain with intercourse, pain with um, uh, ejaculation, pain, uh, or like urinary frequency, it's like extreme, like 10 times, you know, mm-hmm. wake up mm-hmm. 10 times at night or something crazy like that. And those are, or even like perianal pain, those are all pelvic floor. And so they're sent to pelvic floor physical therapy, but until you fix the primary problem, which in my situation with my patients are, are, is a groin hernia, it's actually quite painful to have pelvic floor PT because you're constantly in spasms. So they hate it. Mm-hmm. Um, you fix the hernia, it goes away. It's kind of this fascinating overlap of what I do, what you do, what urologists do, what gynecologists do, yes. what physical therapists do. Yeah. But yes. I do see that point tip of penis pain. And it always throws me off because it's, I know it's not like, it's not STD related. Usually it's not a penile thing, but is it a prostatitis thing or is it a pelvic floor problem? That's what I don't understand. I think think it arises more from the contract, the spasming of the pelvic floor musculature and that kind of like neuromuscular response that radiates to the tip of the penis. You know what I mean? Got it. Um, but I find that so interesting, the, the inguinal hernia stuff that you're talking about, because for me, as physicians, you know, we can get pigeonholed into we yes. see what we see because we know it. You know what I That's mean? That's why I do this because I get to learn from all your specialists. And so, you know, I guess a question on my end would be when I'm seeing these patients, when, when should I be thinking, wait a minute, this might not just be pure pelvic floor. Is there like a certain symptom or sign I should be looking for yeah. that can more towards an inguinal hernia? Yes. Yeah, so inguinal hernias, the small, these are the smalls, you're not the obvious big ones. Um, but the small ones that are harder to kind of think about, they often are activity related pain. So when they're up and about, or if they're doing anything that's involving hip flexion, so sitting or bending kind of crunches or squishes that hernia, it causes more pain. But if life, if they lie flat, like in bed, their pain goes away. Uh, Um, but also you have other things you don't see with like uh, prostatitis or, uh, other kind of pelvic floor stuff, which is you get radiating pain around the back to the lower back mm-hmm. and men, they get testicular pain, um, radiating testicular pain or inner thigh. That's another good one to ask. Does that go to your inner thigh? Um, and sometimes nausea or bloating. So it's, it's a little bit like if you categorize all these symptoms, they overlap when some, but not in others. And it's the other ones that, that don't overlap that help you kind of figure out if it's a hernia or not. Yeah. That's so interesting. I actually have a patient that I'm thinking about, which is why I'm asking. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a question for you. It says, hi, doctor. 18 months ago, I had a small asymptomatic inguinal hernia repaired with mesh via open procedure. I've had pain in my penis and burning when urinating ever since. I also have interstitial cystitis. I tried gabapentin with no success and switched to Lyrica for a year, but that did not help either. I'm recently talking with my doctor to let me try LDN, which I think is low dose naltrexone, right. working up to the four and a half dose slowly in hopes of getting help. I have had physiotherapy and acupuncture. What are your thoughts? So maybe you can explain interstitial cystitis first. What is that? Why do you get it? What are the symptoms? <laughs> I love this. So interstitial cystitis, which is also commonly underdiagnosed in men. So, you know, and, and there's a few reasons why is when there's a degradation in what's called the gag layer of the bladder or the glycosaminoglycan layer, you can think of this layer as the bladder as like a protective layer. Okay. So many people will compare it to things like leaky gut of the bladder. 
All right. Okay. And so oftentimes oh. patients present. And so, you know, in terms of like, there's a MAP and IDDK criteria. And so in terms of how patients present, the biggest symptom that, that is often heard is pain with bladder filling. Okay. So you have persistent urgency, frequency, pain with bladder filling. And this is really important because interstitial cystitis has been renamed so many times in its like existence, painful bladder, bladder pain, but the whole concept being that phenotypically it's bladder centric. It's revolved around the bladder. 80% of patients, both men or women with interstitial cystitis have concomitant pelvic floor dysfunction. Oh, that's why it's so complicated. Got it. That's why it's so complicated. And so, you know, everyone asks like what came first, the chicken or the egg? Is it because there's pain in the bladder tend to hold tension within the pelvic floor as a guardian? Mm. So now the pelvic floor exacerbates the frequency urgency leads to pain at the tip of the penis, that kind of thing. Um, Or you know, just in terms of inflammation, it is, we both, we don't know what causes interstitial cystitis. There's thoughts that it's due to autoimmune processes or things Mm. like inflammation. So is there just chronic inflammation throughout the body that degrades this gag layer of the bladder that ultimately also causes things like trigger or tender points within the pelvic floor? So this patient has pain in the penis and burning when urinating. Is that a consequence of interstitial cystitis or can it be? So the, you know, I think the thing here that we have to be cognizant of is that with interstitial cystitis, and I make a clear distinction of it. One of the biggest symptoms that we talk about is pain with bladder filling. And that Mm -hmm. would be like, you know, something that you always want to ask a patient, like, okay, it burns when you urinate, but burning when you urinate can also be stemming from the pelvic floor, that neuromuscular response, you know, the the spasming of the muscles around the urethra. So I think, I think that, that, that symptom in and of itself can kind of fall in, and, and I don't know if it can fall in the inguinal hernia realm, but it can definitely fall both in interstitial cystitis or in pelvic floor dysfunction. I think the biggest thing is that number one, things like gabapentin, Neurontin, Lyrica, amitriptyline, great medications, mm-hmm. but rafts right? What are they doing? It's essentially down they're like medication. nerve medications, they're nerve medications. They're yeah. down regulating the, they're turning the volume down on whatever neuropathic sensation is occurring. Okay. So ultimately like we're, you and I are kind of discussing, it's not like our biggest passion, which is treating root cause, essentially assessing for root cause. Right. So like, I think part of this is understanding, um, b- because if it's intrinsically coming from the bladder, Neurontin and amitriptyline are not going to fix that bladder lining, right? They're simply right. just turning the volume down on the bladder. So, is so, there a treatment for interstitial cystitis? There are many treatment. There are many treatments, just you know, kind of depending on where. So, so when you break down interstitial cystitis, you can break it down into two patient groups: there are mm-hmm. patients with Hunter's lesions and patients without Hunter's lesions. Mm-hmm. of patients with interstitial cystitis do not have Hunter's lesions. And that's something you see on cystoscopy. That's something you see on cystoscopy. 80%. Okay. 80%. And and this is important because phenotypically you treat these patients very differently. And Hunter's, is that when you do the bladder insufflation, the pressure and see if there's bleeding? So that's what we used to do. Okay. So the whole concept of, so, and, and the AUA guidelines for interstitial societies have changed dramatically. So back in the day, what they used to do was they used to um, essentially do a hydrodistension to the bladder. They'd overfill the bladder and then they would look for glomerulations. The problem that that they started to see was that if you hydrodistend any bladder, you can cause glomerulations. glomerulations, They used to do cystoscopy and then they hang like an IV bag or something that fill the bladder bladder. and then they'd see if it bleeds after certain pressure. Right. Exactly. And, and so there's two problems with that. One is like, okay, so how is that indicative? We now know glomerulations are not specific to interstitial cystitis. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. Great. And then and so, and, and then secondarily, the concept of using hydrodistension as a therapy was to cause a neuropraxia. Uh, Over distend the bladder, patients like got reset. better. Yes, but then guess what happened? They noticed that after three months after hydrodistension, patients ended up recurring, ha- recurrently having their bladder pain and it became harder to treat. Uh, um, so, so 
hydrodistension is not something like we, it, it is not first line. I, I will say the people do use it for interstitial cystitis, but it's not okay. first line anymore for treating interstitial cystitis. Okay. But, okay. and so that's how medications like amitriptyline and gabapentin came into vogue, right? Okay. Because neuropraxia decreased the, the nerve, um, uh, I guess the nerve, neural proliferation around the bladder essentially. Okay. Um, but that still intrinsically didn't fix what we believe causes interstitial cystitis, which is that degradation in the layer. Okay. Yeah. And so that's when um, people came up with things like bladder installations, where we put medications okay. into the bladder. Usually medications like combinations of things like lidocaine, marcaine, heparin, gentamicin, and kenalog, like heparin being a coating agent. That's also how medications like Almiron came into vogue, although now we don't use that much anymore. So what do you do? You do a cystoscopy and you kind of let the bladder simmer in this cocktail? Exactly. Well, and you how don't long? have to do cystoscopy every single time. You can do just a straight catheterization. We ask patients to keep it for at least 30 minutes to an hour. Oh, that's it. Okay. And so you can do like a regular installation. Some people, if they, you know, there's levels to this, you can add a sodium bicarb to the installation to increase bladder penetration. Mm. Some people argue that we can, you can do DMSO. Now we're doing a lot of things like Botox into the trigone of the bladder for patients with interstitial cystitis. If patients have Hunter's lesions, you can do things like a fulguration of the Hunter's lesion. You could do trimcinolone injection of the, the Hunter's lesion. So there's so many different ways we could go to treat this that really looks directly at the bladder. Okay. So it sounds like this patient needs more than just medication, like, because the, the medication alone didn't work and just doing low dose naltrexone is not the right assuming all this is due to interstitial cystitis. I think, I think this patient would benefit from number one, an evaluation of the pelvic floor because mm -hmm. potentially there could be an aspect of it that's coming from the pelvic floor, yeah. which oftentimes can be really helped, not just with pelvic floor physiotherapy, but things like Valium suppositories, Botox to the pelvic floor, pudendal nerve blocks, that kind of thing. And then, and then I think evaluation of the bladder would be key and then ultimately, like, you know, even the concept of doing an installation, if you put a medication to numb the bladder in, and decrease inflammation into the bladder and a patient subsequently feels better, then, you know, some of that pain is coming from the bladder. Do you know okay. what I mean? That's so I think very good. Good, a, a it's not really invasive. And it's not really invasive. Yeah. Um, so, and then I think you're able to peel the onion a little bit more. You know what I mean? How much of it is this? How much of it is that? Because the vast majority of the time, it's not just simply this one thing that's going to go away with low like gabapentin or low dose naltrexone or whatever. Yeah. And the follow-up question is, can you clarify what you mean by neuroproliferation? Is this mean that the innervation, the number of nerves can increase or what increases it? So, so it, it's that, so, and that's the question that occurs. Mm. Is there some sort of central sensitization that's occurring? Is there actual neuro, neuroproliferation where there's more nerves growing? We don't know the answer to that. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? But the concept being that when there is some sort of irritation or aggravation internally in the bladder, our neuromuscular systems rev up essentially the pain gate theory, central sensitization. So mm -hmm. then thereby you have this neuropathic response, right? Because like now the nerves are firing. Yeah. Hyperactive nerves. Happening. Exactly. And so then we use things like these medications to downregulate those nerves. So I think it's more of a central sensitization kind of a thing. But when we talk about things like vulvodynia, we do talk about neuroproliferation. So we, we, we do talk about there being more nerve endings in that area than in other places. So um, I think that, you know, in terms of the, the specific, is it central sensitization? Is it neuroproliferation? That question can't be answered via like a simple conversation. You and know the what best I mean? specialist for this is someone like you, who's done the pelvic pain urology fellowship or a year, but, but not a typical urologist, right? It should be like, is it a bladder specialist or a female urology Probably bladder specialist, right? I think, yeah. I mean, urologist the, who's a bladder specialist. I, yeah. I would do like a urologist who's, who's a pelvic floor or a pelvic pain specialist and yeah. or a bladder specialist. I think that yeah. would be the best for this person. Yeah. So they could completely be evaluated. Okay. Ready for the next question. <laughs> um, hello. I've had three failed ingle hernia repairs open, open via tissue repair. I don't usually have menstrual cramps, but since having had the ingle hernia, I've started to have an increase in pelvic and groin pain and bladder irritation during my period. The menstrual type pain is only on my left side, in the, which is the same location as my hernia, 
what could be causing this flare up during my period? I've been told that it's so, okay. 25% of women that have occult ingual hernias will have pain during their menses. And so then they're like, oh, endometriosis, ovarian cyst, but it's not, it's really their hernia. Um, So I was told that kind of estrogen bump or whatever during menses increases all pain. And that's why, let's say this patient has groin pain, maybe it's hernia pain and worse during her menses, but it's not really menses or menstrual related pain. Is that correct? What I was told? You know, it's interesting because so patients with interstitial cystitis, for example, will get an increase in their pain right before their period. Okay. And so, and so the same concept came into play. So is it hormonal then, you know, is this, but what we believe at least in the pelvic pain world is that it's due to changes in inflammation and inflammatory cytokines during that time. It's not necessarily. Uh, So, you know, the, the, cause the real question is postmenopausal women, it's not like they're pain-free. Do you know what I mean? Right, 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 right. Sure, and so sure. like, I think there's, there's these types of questions are so interesting. Right. Um, and I think that more often than not, there's like a low lying level of inflammation that can often be exacerbated during these time periods. And then people yeah. will ask, can I get on birth control? Hey, will getting on birth control help me? At least in my world, we don't really see it makes that much of a difference. I don't know if Mm -hmm. if patients ever ask you that in in your field, but like in terms of like putting a patient on OCPs, they don't generally like now stop having pain by any means. And that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's just, it's that whole, like, it's worse during my period type thing that takes that away. It's just always, they just have pain. Just, they don't just get the peaks during their, their menses. So it's very possible that these, it's weird that that there've been three attempts at tissue repairs. Usually we move to a different technique once one technique um, fails, but the fact that the pain is worse with menses does not imply it's hormonal or like endometriosis or something, usually because it's growing pain, left-sided. It can just be like a complication from the hernia pair. Let's say you have a recurrence or something similar like that. Um, That said, it's incumbent on whoever is evaluating you to develop, make sure you don't have endometriosis or something else that could be on top of your groin pain, right? Exactly. I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just a tough question to answer because could it be this, could it be that? Sure. But you know, we won't, wouldn't know unless we actually evaluate that, you know, I try to think back at, and And I think endometriosis is one of the most interesting diagnoses. And I don't know if you see this in your specific niche, but yeah. I often find that patients are told everything is endometriosis. I mean, like, yes, it's endo. Um, everything. Yeah. It's, pain. it's endo. And what I see in my practice, every time I cough, I get groin pain. Oh, endometriosis. No. <laughs> I'm like really? <laughs> and then I, I get patients who undergo these like l- huge excision surgeries. And then they're, they're hysterectomy, oophorectomy, hysterectomy for a groin hernia. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then they're back in your office and they're like, but nothing changed. And they're yeah. you know, 35 and they weren't, you know, and they're yeah. like, Oh my gosh. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't call endo endo unless I'm a hundred percent sure it's endo. Um, oh, simply yeah. because I, I think that we can get lost in that diagnosis. I agree. I agree. And I tell everyone, get a second opinion, surgery, surgery, even the small surgery, you know, even if you, they see you or me or whatever, I say, go see a second opinion. It'll bring up new questions and give you more insight into your surgery. It's surgery is serious stuff, no matter how big or how small. We are like, so cut from the same cloth. I absolutely believe that. I always <laughs> tell patients, I'm like, please seek a second. If you have a question about something and you don't feel like it's fully, you don't fully understand it, please. I want you to, you know what I mean? Because I think it's good to be able to have this kind of like back and forth discussion with patients. I actually, you know how some doctors will say, oh, you know, Dr. Google, I don't mind when my patients Google, I like no. it. You know what I mean? I'm like, great. My desk like, right now I've got yeah. like all this paperwork like from it. people. Yeah. Exactly. I'm like, good. You know what you're talking about? You're having, like, we have questions and let's get them answered. Yeah, but totally, I agree. Totally agree. This patient we were just talking about, uh, mentioned that she, she does have, uh, endometriosis, but it's been in remission, but you know, in remission, these, it, it can always come back. You have scar tissue and other injuries from endometriosis that, the, that, you know, maybe have not been addressed. So 
um, it's good to make sure that you see an endometriosis specialist that can exactly. help figure that that out right absolutely um let's see another question i i'm not sure if it's the same patient but um urologist first recommends cystoscopy but now recommends laparoscopic surgery for potential adhesion issues i've had multiple abdominal surgeries so that's a whole adhesion issue um including uh it's left me with no belly button and abdominal wall denervation so what are your thoughts on this approach so bladder is usually not involved in adhesions right I mean, it's very uncommon. I, I, it's so it's so hard to say. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't see it commonly, but I also, I also don't know if there's something else that a physician would have recommended that for. Do you know what? Like, I mean, do, I think do it, can adhesions cause pelvic floor problems? I don't think so. Um, well, in, in some, problems, no, in some women, at least we do see after C-sections, if there's abdominal scar tissue, there can yeah. be some tethering of the pelvic floor to things oh. like, like parts of the hip, the lower abdomen, super pubically. And, you know, you think about it and our bodies are essentially like a pulley lever system. Yes. So like if there's tension in a certain area, you can have spasming of the pelvic floor muscles before. Yes. Like that. Right. Um, so, so, I mean, it, I, it's, do we see it commonly? No. Is it, is there a potential for it? Sure. How can I tell that they switched from a cystoscopy to a laparoscopy? I don't yeah. know. You know, um, that, that, that I'm not sure about. This was uh, provided earlier. What types of disorders or diseases cause groin or pelvic pain that's worse with prolonged sitting? Um, so pelvic floor dysfunction is one of them. Pudendal really? is another one. Yeah. So hmm. you know, with pelvic floor dysfunction, we see this a lot. Um, it often occurs in patients who sit for long periods of time. So oh. I get it a lot in my computer programmers. I get it a lot in my doctors who tend to hold their bladder for long periods of time. Oh yeah, um, I'm there. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you tend to see it a lot even in, in desk jobs. And so oftentimes like in terms of lifestyle modifications, what do we recommend? Mm. Things like a standing desk, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, pudendal neuralgia, which is this interesting term that people tend to throw around that oftentimes people have difficulty deciphering pudendal neuralgia from pelvic floor dysfunction. Do you yes. see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. But often There's one, it could, it's chicken versus egg, right? Oh, exactly. Yeah. And uh, do, they, uh, do they often, is the pudendal nerve often inflamed or irritated with pelvic floor dysfunction? Sure. Um, but with pudendal neuralgia specifically, is there injury to the nerve? Do you know what I mean? Right. Um, do, do they respond to a pudendal nerve block? Like these are all questions that we have to be asking ourselves um, because, because even when you do things like a pudendal nerve ablation and things like that, can pain recur, you know, yeah. do we, can nerves regrow? Like these yeah. are all the things that we have to be thinking about. So with hernias that can cause pelvic floor spasm, the pelvic floor spasm can be spasming, whatever goes through the pelvic floor muscle, which includes the pudendal nerves. Every so often you see someone with pudendal neuralgia um, symptoms, but you know, people don't really wake up with pudendal neuralgia. You can't just like, right. You can't be like walking normally and then up. Oh, now I have pudendal neuralgia. There needs to be like trauma and injury, some lifestyle thing, right? I Scar agree. tissue from something. I, ag I agree wholeheartedly because I think the word pudendal neuralgia to me is like inflammation. Okay. <laughs> where, where is this coming from? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's like, yes. Is there ir irritation or inflammation of the pudendal nerve? Okay. But is it, is it related to some sort of trauma in that nerve? Is it coming from some spasming of the pelvic? You see what I'm saying? Like, yeah. or, you know, like, so, so I think that that's the key that that term throws my patients off a lot because yeah. they're often told they have pudendal neuralgia. They don't quite understand what that means. Right. They don't respond to pudendal nerve blocks. You know what I mean? And so, exactly. so it's just, an, and that's I, such a tough I see a lot of people that are like, Oh, and I, ha I have pudendal neuralgia. I'm like, okay, how was that diagnosed? And yeah you know, it's, it's not, it's something else, whether it's the hernia or something else, but it's so complicated for people to like hear, um, testicular pain or pain with intercourse or, um, that, you know, intravaginal pain, which you can get with, with ingual hernias, um, the automatically, Oh, pedental neuralgia. That's must be what it is. Sorry. Sucks to be you, you know, type thing. And all they needed was like a hernia repair or, something else that's un unrelated to the nerve, but it causes a pelvic floor spasm. 
Right. Or, and I absolutely agree with you. Like we're so on the same page, but, and you know what else we can see? And I'm sure you see this too, or patients that are put on chronic gabapentin get relief for a few months because it, again, like puts, turns the volume down, but then yeah. there is essentially like a hernia or pelvic floor, something that we're missing that rears its ugly head again. So now they're on 900 of gabapentin and why are their symptoms recurring? Because we're not treating root cause. We're simply just, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, just asking it. Yeah, absolutely. Asking it. Yeah. There, there was a question submitted about pudendal neuralgia. And the question is, can how, how can the doctor and patient recognize pain that's caused by pudendal neuralgia and pudendal nerve entrapment? So, you know, you and I were kind of talking about this, like before, um, with, with this, the criteria that people use to de define pudendal neuralgia. Yeah. And essentially it's, it's, you know, pain in the distribution of the pudendal nerve, which by mm -hmm. the way, is a huge distribution, right? So in women, the pudendal nerve has the, the clitoral <laughs> branch, the vaginal branch and the perineal branch. So like, whoa, so we're, where, you know, where along those branches are front to back. About? Yeah. Right. Um, so, you know, pain in the distribution of the nerve worsens with sitting, doesn't awake you, at, doesn't wake you up at night. Um, what, what's the other part of this criteria? Um, well, the worsens with sitting is the most interesting part of it though. Um, and they, mm. and it responds to a pudendal nerve block. I yeah. think the, the biggest problem that I have with pudendal nerve blocks, and I do them all the time. So I'm saying this with like a grain of salt, um, is that blocks are short lived. So mm -hmm. like, how do you know if you got relief with the pudendal nerve block? Do you know what I mean? Sometimes people are just like, I was numb for a little bit. I think I might've felt better, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, is it always one-sided? Pudendal. And, and yes, yes. And so that's another thing. That's such a great point is that when people talk about bilateral pudendal neuralgia, I'm like, generally pudendal neuralgia. <laughs> how the hell does that happen? Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean even with tailbone injuries, it's, it would be unclear to me how you can have that bilaterally. So yes, absolutely. And it's often unilateral. Yeah. Often unilateral and there needs to be a, a, a instigator, mm -hmm. right? And you don't just wake up one day with it. The same is true for angle hernia. So again, another patient I saw today, um, was diagnosed with general femoral nerve pain and of course, that's a hernia until proven otherwise. Same with ilioinguinal nerve pain. It's a her inguinal hernia mm -hmm. until proven otherwise because you don't just wake up one day and have your nerve entrapped or impinged or something, peripheral nerve. So it kind of really bugs me because I have one patient that actually literally was going to be scheduled for a spermatic, sorry, a, a spinal cord stimulator mm -hmm. for their it, chronic ilioinguinal neuralgia. And it was all from a hernia. Never had surgery before, never had trauma before. I mean, it just drives me nuts. The patient knew not to do it, but actually the patient's in your town. <laughs> you know, I, I was just going to say this story sounds eerily familiar um, yeah. simply because I see it all the time. Yeah. Um, and and you have me thinking now, like I'm literally like diagnosing hernias left and right, right now. Yeah. My I mean, face. it's common. You know I mean? Hernias are I'm common. Like, I'm like, this person probably has it, and that person probably has it. <laughs> but what we do see is a lot of that is a lot yeah. of, okay, you know, I can't tell where, what you're, where the pain is coming from. Let's do a block. Sure. Uh, let's do a pudendal block. That didn't work. Let's yeah. do an alloyingal block. That didn't work. Yeah. Let's do a hypogastro block. We keep going up and up. Epidurals, you know what I mean? Yeah. And at some point, patients get benefit, right? And they say, oh, okay, I did better. Yeah, I'm better. <laughs> Keeps coming back, <laughs> though. Let's Oddly. see. Right. Oddly. Right. Oddly. <laughs> or they get things like nerve ablations and then their pain comes back. Likely often. I think that we're missing hernias. I think that people left and right are missing hernias. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, do you know any hernia specialists in Nebraska, Omaha, Dr. Robert Fitzgibbons at, at Creighton university will be one of our guests in a couple of weeks. So, um, He's a great hernia specialist and author of many of the watchful waiting trials. So we're going to be discussing that in a couple of weeks. Um, the other question also kind of related to the first one, can isolated growing pain in the pubic bone region be caused by pudendal nerve problem without any perineal scrotal or vaginal or bladder symptoms? So can you just get one branch? You know, you pain? can. I think it's, I think it's, um, I think you can, but I think it's less Unlikely. likely, yeah, you know right. what I mean? I agree. Um, and, 
I'm so, I love doing this with you because I'm learning at the same time. And I like hearing like other people's opinions on this Mutual, the learning is mutual. (laughs) But um, I think it's pretty rare. And I think that, that kind of part of what we see with this groin pain in general, and I see it a lot in my office too, is, I I don't know if you see this in your specialty, but more often than not, people automatically get an ilioinguinal nerve block, like groin pain, ilioinguinal or hypogastric, like done, you know what I mean? And and without any other symptoms associated with it. So yeah. just like, the, and, and so I think that that. Because becomes, they know how to do it. They are, it's, it's often not general femoral. That's more difficult. Everyone gets ilioingual nerve block. Everyone gets, and hypogastric. <laughs> like those two are like, yeah. but, but I think it would be exceedingly rare. And then on <laughs> top of that, the question always, I always ask the question, then what's, what are you going to do? So now. You're going to get nerve blocks all the time. You're going to get on gabapentin. Spinal stimulator. Spinal stimulator, right, exactly. So So I I think you should go searching for another cause if that was the case. That's, again, second opinion. Always good to get a second opinion. Um, Someone on here uh, says pudendal nerve pain is humbling and excruciating pain, which is true. You do not want to have that diagnosis. And I feel like it's thrown out so often, but it's a horrible diagnosis. It, very it, difficult. It, it's very difficult and it impacts quality of life so significantly. Yeah. That, you know, I think that it builds a cycle almost. And I think that's oftentimes why you see pudendal neuralgia occur with things like pelvic floor dysfunction, a lot of guarding maneuvers, a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it really become, and then quality of life gets worse because then urological symptoms develop or, you know, other type of pain symptoms develop. Yeah. And then teasing that out can be really difficult, but I do agree pudendal neuralgia is a really tough diagnosis. Yeah. And I think that in general, it's why it's why I'm, I think it's so important to be very specific before you give it out so that, so that patients aren't pigeonholed and like, you know, it's ultimately. Do you do uh, pudendal nerve blocks? I do. And um, uh, anterior or posterior? I actually do anterior. So I do it yeah. the old school way. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. um, I go inferior and medial to the ischial tuberosity yeah. and pop, just get that pudendal nerve, right? Like that blindly. Mm-hmm. It, and ultimately yeah. that's how, you know, old school OBs used to do it yeah. for, for pain control. Um, but I find that in terms of like needing ultrasound and stuff, like I find that it works really well. Um, so I tend to do it in the office, especially if there's a question of it, mm-hmm. just so that diagnostic for diagnostic reasons. And do some people do like ablation, like alcohol ablation of that nerve? Is that safe to do? I and don't do distal. that. Oh, I don't God. do that. But there are physicians in New York who do do that. Mm-hmm. I think the hardest part with ablations, I feel, is that oftentimes I find that patients recur. Uh, yeah, that's patients. what I've seen. Yeah. yeah. So I maybe I only cool. see the recurred ones, but they're like actually worse off in some ways. I think so. I, I, yeah. I do see that. And so I am, it's rare for me to recommend it unless I really think it. Got it. Um, we have some, you know, geniuses uh, as our, as our viewers. So <laughs> the question is, what is a nant? I think it's a French word, nant criteria for and, and other algorithms for diagnosing pudendal nerve pain. And this is kind of what you, what we were discussing before this. So um, the Nance criteria is the five pronged criteria. The first of which being pain in the distribution of the pedental nerve. The second being worsened by sitting. Mm-hmm. Um, the third being um, responding to a pudendal nerve block. The fourth being no sensory loss, I believe. Okay. Um, and the, the fifth being that it does not wake you up at night. And I think that that's oh. really interesting. Um, I often find with a lot of pelvic floor patients, at least their pain worsens at night. Um, oftentimes, cause they're, they're up on their feet all day. They're contracting yeah. the pelvic floor muscles all day. Um, so, so I guess that's part of why they use that delineation to um, diagnose pudendal nerve pain. But at the end of the day, I think it takes a good exam too, because I think a lot of these symptoms can go either way. Yeah. Very difficult disorder. Now question, for, I'm sorry, I'm not yeah. asking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me. Do you ever notice changes in, in patients um, symptoms during the nighttime with hernias? Like, is there, is there a change in terms of like time of day at all? 
Yeah, so classically they wake up with no pain and by as the day goes on, they, it's worse because they're upright, more active. Mm -hmm. And then um, every so often, some people say they are, they're woken up by their pain. That's not common, but it can go either way. It's, it's not specific um, either way. Mm -hmm. And um, there's other hernias like obturator hernias and kind of weirder, rare hernias where they prefer not to sleep like in fetal position. It's more like frog legged. Mm -hmm. and that's to open up that space more. Um, so yeah, everything is, is uh, there's, there's a wide variety, but classically they're better in the morning and worse towards the end of the day. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, here's another one. I'm six and six and nine months status post bilateral FAI. So that's femoroacetabular uh, impingement and labrum repairs that's for the hip with multiple years of and a long history of perineal pain labial itching pain of the introitus that's something we haven't discussed is labial symptoms amitriptyline which is a nerve pain medicate did not help nor did valium suppositories which is a muscle relaxant recent pelvic physical therapy seems to flare it up pelvic floor issues or hernia issues are both question mark this is awesome. Um, that's a lot. So that, that's a lot. So I'm looking at the question right now as I'm kind of thinking about it, but a couple of things come yeah. um, this strike out at me. Number one, labial itching. Not all itching is infectious. And this is something for like the general GYNs out there because oftentimes these patients are being swabbed for things like recurrent BV, recurrent yeast. And this is itching can often be a neuromuscular symptom, right? So I like- A that nerve pain. Patient, it could be nerve, nerve right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And pain at the introitus. So, so mm -hmm. there appears to be a neuro. Where's the introitus? Where is the introitus? Front of the vagina. Yeah. The little V yeah. like right. And, and so, so the intro and almost like your vestibule, right? So it's yeah. the vestibule of the vagina. And so part of what we do in our exams in the office is we take a Q-tip and we go all around the vestibule. And I say, mm -hmm. is this pain? Is this pressure? Is this stinging? Is this burning? Um, because Ultimately, itching and burning can be signs of neuroproliferation or nerves. Okay. Um, so yeah, burning is very classic nerve type. Itching less common, but both can be nerve. Both yeah. can be nerve. Absolutely. Yeah. The fact that amitriptyline didn't help. I mean, again, in general, I've, when we talk about medications, I always tell patients, it's like me having a tennis racket and Andre Agassi having a tennis racket. He plays a lot better than I do. We have the same tools. It's just how you use them. So, you know, were you on 10 milligrams of amitriptyline? Were you on 25? Were you on 50? You know, I mean, in terms of like things like vulvodynia, the therapeutic dose of amitriptyline is somewhere around 25 milligrams. And that can vary per patient. So um, vulvodynia is labial, technically labial as well. Introidal, or introidal, introidal pain, okay. vestibular, mm -hmm. and right, it can be divided sense. up into different groups. So it can be divided up into neuroproliferate, ne neuroproliferative vestibulodynia. It can be divided mm -hmm. up into hormonally mediated, and it can maybe div mm -hmm. div divided up into inflammatory with pelvic floor dysfunction. Yeah. So, and that's really contingent on how it looks, how the the vestibule looks on exam under colposcopy. Um, and so, so with this, there's a few like different issues because even with Valium suppositories, I often see Valium suppositories are simply a mask, um, you know, and sometimes if you, depending on where you put them, you put them vaginally, do you put them rectally? Patients can respond very differently. I never have patients on Valium suppositories for more than like somewhere around six to eight weeks. And mm -hmm. I think the response to a Valium suppository doesn't determine whether it's pelvic floor or not. So I don't think that right. that really helps in general. But the purpose is it's a muscle relaxant directly adjacent to the pelvic floor muscle. So it should technically uh, relax those muscles technically, but when placed vaginally, the absorption rates are really not that great. Um, when oh. placed rectally, they are a little bit better, but in oh. addition, they don't work overnight. So, you know, patients, like they're not going to put in one Valium suppository and feel relief. Generally it can take anywhere around six to eight weeks and all the data suggests doing pelvic floor PT at the same time. Yeah. So the um, way I'm looking at this, she's got a hip, she's got perineal, labial, introitus so hernias for sure don't give introitus pain that we can take that out of the picture um it should not give labial itching or burning but you can have hypersensitivity of the labium only on one side unless you have bilateral hernias um 
But the issue is hip pain and hernia pain are very overlap a lot. So I see a lot of orthopedic patients too. And you can get an MRI and show FAI and labral tears and a lot of people. And the question is, is that really the reason for their symptoms? And one of the key questions is, do you have buttock pain or is it all in the front? And if they have buttock pain, that's usually hip. If it's only pain in the front, in the groin, and not also in the buttock, then it's usually, then it can be either hip or hernia. The other question I ask is, um, is the pain better when you lay flat? So with a hip problem, it's not necessarily better when you lay flat. It doesn't go away. Um, whereas with a hernia pain, it should get better when you lay flat. Of course, there's exceptions, but that's the general rule. So I'm going to say I don't think this is going to be hernia related. Um, it's always worth getting an imaging to, to rule that out. But hip problems can cause pelvic floor spasm, right? Absolutely. I was just okay. going to say that. Yep. Labral tears can absolutely call, cause pelvic floor issues. Okay. Um, and, and pelvic floor issues can absolutely call, cause things like labial itching, like, um, uh, and can often cause mm. like literal stimulation, can cause things like- Is that the pudendal uh, again? Mm -hmm. oh, yes, it is. Okay. Yep. And, and things like introidal burning. So, you know, I think that, that this patient would definitely benefit from a, a further evaluation of their pelvic floor and their vestibule, just the, the vestibule of the vagina, essentially to see what's happening there. What we see a lot of too, with which a lot of people don't, don't recognize is with things like pelvic floor dysfunction, especially when, when there is a significant amount of it, you decrease capillary blood flow to the vestibule. Mm -hmm. Combine that with patients who are either postmenopausal or on long-term OCPs, you alter the pH of the vagina. You alter the pH oh. of the vagina, which can often cause things like micro tears, a lot of pain with sex, and that can also cause things like recurrent BV, recurrent yeast. So again, um, there's many different ways that this can affect both vestibular and labial function. Um, and yeah, and, and so I don't like to chalk it all up to the pelvic floor, but there are definitely seems to be a pelvic floor issue and beyond potentially. So if the hip is causing pelvic floors, or then you have to go back and fix the hip problems, right? Or physical therapy or something, right? Yeah. I mean, there is like at, actually at Cornell, Strong Coleman is someone that's, it's really big on doing hip labral surgery for patients with pelvic floor dysfunction. Oh. It, it's a, it's a pretty big surgery. So yeah. oftentimes, you know, patients, and again, the hard part is, in my opinion, I don't know if you see this, muscles have muscle memory. So whatever came first, the chicken or the yeah. egg, I don't really know. Yeah. But ultimately, oftentimes I see a lot of patients post-labral surgery that continue to have their symptoms. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think- They have a hernia, but okay. <laughs> they have a hernia too. With common things being common, you treat yeah. patients like they're your family. Yeah. Yeah. You would want to do the least invasive to start with. You know what I mean? Which would right. be- either cardiac surgery or evaluating their pelvic floor. <laughs> do you do uh, Botox injections into the pelvic floor? Sure do, yeah. Yep. And how does that work? Do they end up like incontinent or? Never, no. Never. Oh, okay. You know, and, and of course it's always like a theoretic risk. Yes. And, and there's a difference between theoretic and actual risks. But I, what I always tell patients is like, number one, I'm not going to make you like the patients walking around New York with a ton of Botox in their face where they can't move their head. Yeah, Less is more. Like just a, you only need a small amount to really release and relax those muscles. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, and then number two, it works in conjunction with pelvic floor physical therapy. So okay. if you want longevity to it, if you want to not have Botox again, then you have to do it at the same time. You know what I mean? Because that internal myofascial release is really key to keeping the muscles released and relaxed. So you do the Botox first and then they do the physical therapy to follow or? I usually have patients meet with the physical therapist prior to doing Botox. Um, mm -hmm. And then, and that way they have like, so, like, and oftentimes, they will report that that PT flares their symptoms, right? Because if you're pushing on an actual trigger yes, point, they what is do. it going to do? can't tolerate it. Yeah, right it's going to spasm right back at you. Um, and so, so, um, and then, and then I do Botox, and then I have them continue to see the pelvic floor physical therapist. And is Botox is not covered by insurance for this purpose, correct? No, it's not. Yeah. Um, it's an off-label use for Botox. Yeah but not rightfully so, because I will I know. tell you, there's tons of data on it for the pelvic floor. Yeah. It's simply one of these, you know, dare I say, like 
political issues where it's just not, it, I mean, it absolutely should be something that's, that's FDA approved for, I mean, it's FDA approved for migraines, for TMJ. That's the same neuromuscular response you're dealing with with pelvic yeah. floor dysfunction. It's kind of nuts. Yeah, yeah it, it is nuts because I use it for uh, abdominal wall in preparation for like a massive abdominal reconstruction or some people have really tight repairs yeah. and you have to loosen it up for them to help get over the pain hump. And, you know, fortunately I live in Beverly Hills, so there's Botox in every corner. <laughs> it's, it's not hard to find Botox. <laughs> uh, but that said, yeah, the patients have to pay out of pocket for it. It's not fair. It's not, it's not fair. And I think that oftentimes that can pertain to so many aspects of both our fields. It's because often what we deal with is so nuanced and requires such diligence on the details that yeah. insurances will say, I'll cover tramadol or, or, you know, a, a muscle relaxer before I'll actually cover an actual evaluation of the, the, um, initiating cause. So yeah. it's really unfortunate. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. There's a question about adhesions. I know in gynecology, adhesions are uh, considered a part of the pelvic pain um, kind of workup. Can adhesions by themselves cause pain? What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that these are nerves involved or just vascular? Um, so can adhesions by themselves cause pain? I think adhesions alone in a certain circumstance don't always have to cause pain. Like for example, right. like when I have uh, my C-section scar, I have a keloid, that's an adhesion in and of itself, right? It's scar mm -hmm. tissue. Um, it doesn't cause me pain. It does it not look pretty sure, but it's there, right? So yeah. adhesions themselves are not, I think what's super pathologic, but, but, you know, adhesions can cause pulling and tugging of the muscles in certain places. It's almost like our body's response to say something's wrong, which can often cause this like pain gate central sensitization issue. So yeah. then you start to feel pain in that area. So of course they can be innervated in that sense. But I think that, um, that, you know, not all that, not all adhesions are pathologic, so to speak. Yeah, I agree. Um, that's very, very true. Although that said, I've had a handful of patients who were like, there's no way this adhesion caused pain. You get rid of it. And they're like, oh, I'm so much better. Yeah. What'd you do? I'm like, I, I did very little, but That's great. I think every patient's different. The, um, thing, the thing I worry about adhesions is them recurring. You know what I mean? I think for yes, what you it's true. much, it's much nicer and, and, and much more nuanced, but you know, in terms of like GYN surgery it can be pretty like, it, yeah, I mean, it, bloody, yeah, bloody. And, you guys deal with big blood vessels. Yeah. Um, this is a question that I love your input on. I'm glad a patient asked it. Is it true that people with pre-existing pain before surgery are more likely or greater odds of developing chronic pain after surgery? And why is that? This is something that in the hernia world, they talk about all the time. Oh, you operate on pain, you'll get pain. And I'm like, I don't agree with that. I think you're just maybe doing the wrong operation or something. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of patients in general surgery are not operated on because like, oh, you already have so much pain. You're going to have chronic pain after surgery. And yeah, there's so much pain because someone needs to fix their freaking hernia or something like that. Right. And I don't see that. Uh, I'm also an optimist. And I try and like, I, I, I operate on patients that have pain all the time. But right. what's your thought? Is this some, is this a myth or is this something that is taught to you guys too? You know, it, it's interesting. I have similar, similar viewpoints in the sense that, um, I, I only treat pain patients, right? So to yeah. me, like not treating a pain patient is, is horrible. It's nuts. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, no, like this is the patient that deserves, um, some sort of intervention to help alleviate their pain. Correct. But I think that the way that this occurs, number one is, I mean, twofold. Number one, I think in general, pain patients are highly stigmatized and it's part of the problem in seeking care just in general. Like they don't know to come to me, to you, to come to anyone, because most of the time they're just told, well, you're going to have to learn to live with this. And that's the way that you have to go. I think number two, this concept of the pain gate theory is really interesting. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, like when you develop pain in a certain area, 
and you rev up these nerves, right? And you rev them up and then you get a tiny little cut. That tiny little cut doesn't feel like a tiny little cut now. That tiny little cut feels like a huge cut, right? It feels like yes. a big thing. And that that's not the patient's fault. You know what I mean? Right. That's by virtue, the pain gate theory. That is why. Um, but I also think if we don't assess that root cause by means of whether hernia, pelvic floor, whatever, then ultimately these patients are just told to get on pain management yeah, medication. I agree. I agree. You know? I think, I think the art and the beauty of medicine is lost in many uh, practitioners. And so they just don't want to deal. And that it's such a great way to say you operate on pain, you'll get pain. And just, I, I, I hate that. I hate it when they say that. Oh my God, we are done. That went by I so just fast. tell you that went so fast. I enjoyed every moment of it. Me and too. let me tell you, so for those of you that don't know, I hope you do follow Dr. Balani at pelvic pain doc on all the different social media um, platforms. She is funny and she is fun. <laughs> and it's just, uh, it's, she's very entertaining. And at the same time, like you learn a lot from her, her social media. So I, I hope you all um, follow her and if they want to see you, can they see you in person? In just- yeah, where well, they can see me in person. We do We do still do virtual appointments as long okay, as they're willing to come to New York if they need to. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I would be honored to take care of um, and, and anyone who you take care of in general. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I do the same. So with the whole pandemic, we've just learned that uh, virtual appointments or what I call online consults too, and people that are out of state or whatever, happy to at least tell you. And then I'll be like, yeah, then go to Dr. Bolani afterwards. I think this is something that she can handle. So yeah, love it. Thank you. Okay, awesome. everyone. Thanks for joining me on another Hernia Talk Tuesday. This was a great, great hour. As you know, this will be posted on my YouTube channel. Dr. Bolani, you can share it with uh, anyone you want afterwards. It'll be up on the YouTube channel and um, Facebook Live at Dr. Toe 5. Thanks everyone. See you next week. We have another amazing guest and I love doing these every week. And I'm so happy that so many people also enjoy talking about hernias and hernia related topics, pelvic pain, et cetera. Thank you very much for your time and um, hope you enjoy your time with your family. Thank them for me for borrowing you for the full hour. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay. Take care. We'll see you. Okay. Bye. Bye.